Maybe you can relate to this question of, does God hear my prayers? Does he hear me? When I offer my prayer up, does a blessing truly come down? I'm sure Martha and Mary were asking that question. They're two of the three main characters in the particular miracle that we're considering this weekend. Uh, we're working our way through the Gospel of John, looking at the miracles of Jesus as recorded in John's Gospel, uh, learning what it's like to be awestruck by the power and the miraculous presence of Jesus Christ. That story is found in John chapter 11. You can follow on the screen as I, I read the words here in just a minute, or if you'd like to, to open your Bible or look on your smartphone and you do it however you prefer. We do have an outline. We'll be filling that in, in in just a moment, but first let's pray. Gracious, gracious heavenly Father, Blessings and honor and praise and loudest applause be given to you, our King, our Savior. How kind you are to us. We tend to forget you, Father, but you never forget us. Some of us have even walked away from you, but you have pursued us. And on those days that we thought we were in charge, you didn't get angry or abandon us. And on those days we wondered if anyone was in charge, you still were. So now, Heavenly Father, will you minister to our hearts? We cannot do anything without you. Would you forgive our speaker so many sins? Would you, would you help us to have a glimpse of Jesus? All, all we want to see is Jesus. And we pray in the sweet name of Jesus. And all the church said, Amen. John chapter 11 and verse 1 through verse 6. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Let's begin by looking at the problem and the promise. The problem was the sickness of Lazarus. I mean, the words are heavied with reality. A man named Lazarus was sick. Your journal might read something similar. A girl named uh, Mary is lonely. A, a man named Tom is confused. A, a, a family uh, by the name of Jones is in crisis. It, this is a picture of Lazarus who really represents all of us in those seasons in which we are in a desperate situation. Lazarus was sick. His body ached. His fever raged. His stomach churned. He was sick. But he had something going for him. Well, really, he had someone going for him. He had a friend, a friend by the name of Jesus. Yes, the water to wine Jesus, the storm to calm water Jesus, the uh, basket to a uh, buffet Jesus, the miracle working Jesus. And Jesus was his friend. And so the sisters of Lazarus sent a not too subtle message to Jesus with a friend. And the friend went to Jesus and said, uh, Lord, the one you love is sick. What a picture of a simple yet powerful prayer. The, the sisters simply framed the problem and they sent it to Jesus. They left it with him. And they appealed, ba their appeal was based not on their love for Jesus, but on Jesus' love for them. You see, prayer calls upon the heart of God. Prayer stands upon our heart. The one you love is sick. And they sent word to Jesus. But then the scripture says, when Jesus heard it, heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God. So that the son of God will receive glory from this. Jesus is not saying that, that Lazarus will not endure death. He's simply saying that this sickness will not end in death. 
This sickness will not claim Lazarus. Lazarus, we will soon see, passes through the valley of the shadow of death, but he doesn't stay there. Jesus has a plan for this sickness. It's going to be used to reveal or to teach something about the glory or the power or the preeminence of God. The sickness is for the glory of God. Now, some singers sing for the glory of God. Uh, Preachers preach for the glory of God. Uh, uh, Artists paint for the glory of God. But there's also a call that's placed upon people to be sick for the glory of God. Nobody signs up for this one. But sometimes it comes our way to suffer an affliction so that the power of God can be revealed. And if you can relate, then you're going to appreciate what Jesus did. There was reason for good news, Lazarus and Martha and Mary must have thought, because now Jesus knows. Surely Jesus will show up any minute. I would imagine they told each other, uh, Jesus will be here today. I would imagine that Lazarus was often asking Mary and Martha, any word from Jesus yet? Uh, Surely they thought that Jesus was going to show up. But, the scripture says, Jesus stayed where he was for the next two days. So the crisis of the health was exacerbated by the crisis of the delay. Jesus stayed where he was. Days came and went. No Jesus. Lazarus began to fade. Still no Jesus. Then Lazarus died. Even then, no Jesus. So the crisis of the moment prepared the way for the complaint and the confession. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Now the rabbinic faith taught that the soul lingered near the body for three days. And so this is the fourth day. So in the eyes of the family and the thoughts of the public, Jesus showed up one day too late. The sisters must have thought this. You remember there are two sisters, Martha and Mary. And you may recall that Martha is the spunky one and Mary is more withdrawn. And so Martha... When she heard the word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. So Lazarus has been dead for the better part of a week. In our day, by now, the body would have been embalmed or the body would have been cremated. By now, four days in, the funeral would have taken place. If not, it's happening any, very soon. Uh, By now, uh, the songs have been selected. The burial plot has been purchased. Everything is set up for the service of remembrance. I know this because I'm a preacher and I've been involved in the planning of dozens and dozens of funeral services. In fact, I can't tell you how many times I have turned to this very passage as a go-to passage for what to say at a funeral. So many times I've retold this story of Mary and Martha. Why, I've even, standing near the casket, looked at the family, having told the story and said, are you a Martha? Are you a Mary? Have you done and did you do what what they did? Did you send word to Jesus and say, Lord, the one you love is sick? Did you keep vigil at the convalescent home or at the hospice care or in the emergency room? And you waited and you waited and you waited and you wondered where Jesus was. And then the one you love died. That's what happened to Martha and Mary. And you've wondered, does Jesus have anything to say at a funeral? Well, boy, he did that day. (laughs) Picking up again in John chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Now look at verse 26. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? 
When you make a list of the great questions in the Bible, be sure and put that one there. Look to whom Jesus asked this question. He asked it to a bereaving sister. Look where Jesus is as he asked this question. He is in, within the vicinity of a cemetery where his good friend Lazarus has been buried. Look when Jesus asked this question. He asks it four days too late. Four days too late. Lazarus, his friend, is four days dead, four days gone, four days buried. Martha has had plenty of time to give up on Jesus. Yet now this Jesus... This Jesus has the audacity to say, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this? You, Martha, do you believe this? This statement of my deity and your destiny. Do you believe this? Now, maybe Martha answered him with a lilt in her voice. Maybe she raised both hands into the air with triumphant fists. Go ahead and place a dozen exclamation marks at the conclusion of her response if you want. But I don't. I hear, I hear a sigh. I hear maybe a gulp. I hear a timid reply that she musters up enough faith to say this. Yes, Lord, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. She can't bring herself to say, you can defeat death. She's not quite there yet, but she can bring herself to offer this triple tribute that he is the son of God, that he is the Messiah, and he is the one who has come into the world. She can muster that enough. And when she musters that, that, that becomes a mustard seed faith with which Jesus can work. And he responds. And his compassion and command surface in the final section of the scripture. Martha fetched her sister. Mary wept at the sight of Christ. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. What do you think caused Jesus to weep? What was it that caused Jesus to to shed a tear? Was he sad at the passing of his friend? Was he sad at the power that death had over his people? Was he angry at what he saw? Was he moved with what he saw? Maybe it was a combination of everything because now we see a determined, not a despondent Jesus take charge. Here it comes, folks. You're about to see something you've never seen anybody do in a cemetery. He takes command. He's no doubt the only person to ever issue a command to a cadaver and get by with it. He told Martha to roll the stone away. She hesitated. Do you blame her? She didn't want to move the stone away. She said, Lord, by now the body's going to stink. But Jesus insisted and she obeyed. And Jesus, prone as he was to thank God for the impossible challenges of life, offered a prayer of gratitude, and then here it is. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. Will you do that verse with me? Give it everything you got. Are you ready? Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come on, come out. One more time. Lazarus. Come out. And what happened? The dead man came out. His hands and his feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. This is a command that Jesus gave and not a suggestion, an imperative, not an idea. 
a summons. He yelled into the very caverns of death. Other translations say he cried with a loud voice. He roared with a loud voice. He shouted as loudly as he could. So the resurrection and the life issued a command into the cavern of death. Don't you know somewhere in paradise an angel smiled? And don't you know somewhere in Hades a demon groaned? And don't you know that the sound of Jesus Christ, his voice echoed throughout the caverns until it reached the very pinnacle of the universe, the throne room of God. And somewhere in the vicinity, a now healthy and happy Lazarus heard the command. He didn't want to come back. I mean, he's healed. He's happy. He's sipping a latte with Moses. (laughs) He's enjoying the golden streets. He didn't want to come back. Of that, I'm certain. But he had to come back. Of that, he was certain. Because Jesus calls the shots. And when the commander calls, we respond. And so, just like that, the spirit of Lazarus descended from heaven and entered into the cavern of the burial spot, entered into the very body of Lazarus and reanimated his body and he lifted himself up somewhat like an Egyptian mummy still wrapped and rose to his feet and lumbered in the direction of the now open tomb and Jesus upon seeing that figure at the mouth of the tomb said unwrapping let the boy go home I'm thinking Jesus must have smiled Because he knew at that moment he had just given preachers like me everything we need to say at a funeral. That Christ is in control. And for that reason, I turn to this passage at funerals. And when I get to this point, I have to be careful because I tend to get just a little bit excited. And I tend to forget it's a memorial service. But it's hard not to get excited. And it's hard not to look at the people with enthusiasm, yes, even joy. Christians are the only people can celebrate at a funeral because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the living and the dead. Amen. And so there's a reason to get excited and I do and I tell the people in the memorial service, some of you have heard me say it, he's going to do it again. A Lazarus moment awaits all who place their faith in Jesus. All who do what Lazarus did, Lazarus called Jesus his friend. You call Jesus your friend, he calls you his friend. And he takes responsibility for you, he'll do it again. A repeat performance is already scheduled. Would you be open to this miracle? Would you be open to letting Jesus change the way you see death? The day is coming when the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a, what is it? Commanding shout. With the voice of an archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And there we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Indeed, we should. We should encourage one another with these words. Be open to this miracle. But even more importantly, be a part of this miracle. Right now, it's just you and Jesus. And right now, Jesus is asking you, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Not, does your family believe this? Does your church believe this? Do your parents believe this? Your society believe this? Do you, down deep in your heart, Do you, do you believe this? What Jesus said about himself, I am the resurrection and the life. 
I'm in charge of the grave. I have the keys to hell. I own heaven. Do you believe my claims about my deity and do you believe my promises about your destiny that everyone who believes in me and lives in me, though he dies, he shall live? Do you believe this? Do you? You know what? Do you know what the billionaire and the pauper have in common? They both die. Death is the great equalizer. Everybody dies unless Christ comes first. Everybody dies. But not everybody faces death in the same way. Death is to be respected, but it's not to be feared. Death is to be regarded, but death has no call and no command over the child of God. And some of you, because of your fear of death, are not living your life. You've not dealt with this inevitable exit that God has talked about since the beginning of time. Would you please, would you please consider this question that Jesus is asking you today? Do you believe this? I think George Strait is right. What goes up does come down. And when we offer our faith and we offer our prayers to Christ, what he sends down are blessings. And he says, I know without a doubt, what goes up comes down. Thank you, Lord, because we do believe that you own the keys to eternity. And we pray, oh, heavenly Father, that today, you would find some children who have never said yes to you and you would give them the faith to answer, yes, I believe that you are the resurrection and the life. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said,